For those of you who are joining us, we're going to get started in just a minute. All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I know there's attendees joining right now, um, but I think once we get going, we'll see uh, more people joining. Um, Kaji, is everything all set in terms of Facebook and all that? Yes, we are live. All right, thank you. All right, well, um, welcome to everyone uh, to this webinar on mental health in the city of Framingham. Um, I'm Adam Steiner, I'm a Framingham City Councilor, um, but tonight I'm just emceeing as somebody who's concerned about um, my friends and family and neighbors. Uh, this webinar is being recorded for TV and it is uh, live on Facebook. Um, it'll be played on the government channel at a later date. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of tonight. So I'm gonna talk for no more than five minutes, I promise, giving this overview. We will then, um, hear a little bit about the jail diversion program uh, for about 10 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes on identifying signs and symptoms of mental illness. Uh, 15 minutes mental health uh, first aid overview and then we want to talk about some of the resources that are available here in the city of Framingham. Um, some that I'll share with you um, but the majority of the presentation will be done um, by our two um, great speakers, Caitlin and uh, Jason Ball, um, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, if you have questions during the seminar, please feel free, or the webinar, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, at the, um, we're gonna leave the last 25 minutes for answering questions. Um, and then at the very end, the mayor's gonna join us to help us wrap up the evening. Um, I wanted to give some, some thank yous. Um, first, uh, Cheryl Goldstein, uh, uh, who's a fellow District 3 resident and also a member of the Disability Commission. She really came up with um, the idea for this, identified the fact that there's, a, there's such a huge need. You know, we think about, you know, the, the health crisis we're in and the economic crisis, but uh, Cheryl really saw that there's a, a mental health crisis out there. And, and this, she's got big ideas, so this is really just going to be one, you know, the first event, hopefully in a series, to help us continue to address the needs that are out there. Um, I also wanted to thank the City of Framingham for helping to um, run this and also promote it, the Framingham Health Department, the um, Framingham Public Schools, the Office of the Mayor, the City Council, uh, Advocates Inc, um, who Caitlin works for, uh, the Police Department, uh, the Senate President Karen Spilka, and our State Representatives Maria Robinson, Jack Lewis, and Carmen Gentile. Um, thank you to all of them. Um, all right, I think my five minutes are almost up. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to Caitlin. Caitlin, you're gonna have to help me. I don't wanna mispronounce your last name. And my, you know, your big debut here on City of Framingham. Caitlin Dehe. <laughs> Dehe, thank you. I should have practiced that in advance. And Officer Jason Ball, thank you both. And I will turn it over to you now. Thanks, Adam and Cheryl, um, for putting this all together. We are happy to be here. Um, we, like I said, are going to start um, with a quick overview of our um, co-response program. So 
just a little bit background about myself. I'm um, the manager of the Advocates Co-Response Training and Technical Assistance Center. Um, my work there is to replicate the co-response model, which I'll talk more about in a minute, uh, across the state. And I also do a lot of police training in mental health first aid, which we will also talk about later uh, this evening. So before I took that, before I took this role, I was a co-response clinician in the city of Framingham. It was still a town then, actually. Um, but I responded on the 412 shift with the police um, to calls for service for about four years. So um, the co-response model is uh, started here in Massachusetts in 2003. Dr. Sarah Abbott is our program director, and she uh, was the first co-response clinician in the state possibly in the country. Um, she uh, co-founded the program with um, Craig Davis, chief of uh, Regis College Campus Safety currently, he's been the Ashland chief. Um, but when he worked in Framingham, they worked together to really meet a need that they, the Framingham police saw. They were going to calls um, for service with individuals that had underlying mental health concerns and their police officers they are not trained to handle those types of situations so they reached out to advocates and said hey what can we do how can we help um, help ourselves do these calls better and out of that came this co-response model which pairs clinicians master's level clinicians with police officers our clinicians are embedded in the, the police department they ride along um, to calls for service and help de-escalate things on scene. They're able to do safety assessments on scene. They're able to divert individuals from unnecessary uh, emergency room transports and also from um, arrest if it's appropriate. Um, that happens by them being on scene. So the ride along portion of our response model is really important. Um, that's how we're able to, to do those diversions. Our clinicians also um, have monthly operations meetings with the police department to check and see how things are going, make sure that there's not, you know, what are we doing well, what challenges are we facing, and how can we brainstorm to make those better. So um, that's an important part of the model. And then the final part of the model that's really important is the uh, cross training that comes through the co-response model, both formally and informally. Formally, um, you know, clinicians uh, will do training to, for, for police officers during roll call, during in-service training. Um, and then the other piece that happens sort of naturally and organically is the training they get while riding with, the, with each other, right? So the clinicians are learning and getting trained on police things by riding with the police. And the police are getting trained um, by the clinicians just simply by observing them when they're on these calls with individuals, you know, words to use, ways to de-escalate. Um, it's sort of just a natural process that happens. We have data to show that a year after a clinician is embedded in a program, officer attitudes towards individuals with mental illness um, change in a positive direction. Uh, they become more confident in de-escalating and dealing with individuals with mental illness um, on their own when a clinician is not available. Um, so those are really good outcomes. Um, they're sort of, we're not the, originally in, um, the original intent of the program, but a good unintended consequence um, that's come out of, out of our work. So like I said, in Framingham, Framingham was our first program in 2003. In 2008, we replicated in Marlboro. In 2011, Watertown. And then in 2015, we started our first regional program in the towns of Ashland, Sherburne, Holliston, and Hopkinton. Now we're in 15 departments. Um, the other departments include Medic, Franklin, Medway, Sudbury, Hudson, Westboro, Southboro, and Northboro, um, and counting. So we are getting requests all the time to replicate this model across the state and um, out of state as well. Um, we've been doing it for a long time, so we sort of have it down to a science. Um, so that's sort of a brief overview of the co-response model. I want to um, do a couple of things. First, I want to introduce um, Bonnie Fugaro and Georgia Kramer. Um, they are your current uh, co-response clinicians in Framingham, um, and so I'll let them introduce themselves and then 
um, Jay can talk a little bit about his experience with the program as an officer. Hi everyone, my name is Bonnie Cucaro. Um, I am a jail diversion clinician supervisor, so I oversee the programs in Framingham as well as a number of other programs. I currently correspond during the day shift in Framingham, so I've been um, working alongside the police for about two years in Framingham, um, eight to four shift. Hi everyone, I'm Georgia Kramer. I am the evening shift clinician here in Framingham, so I work 3.30 to 11.30, corresponding in Framingham. Thanks, ladies. Say, oh, go ahead, Bonnie. I was just going to say, I do just want to say that Georgia is working. She was kind enough to join us for a period of time, so she probably will have to jump off um, just because she is uh, corresponding right now. So just wanted to let everyone know that. Yes. Yeah. That's important. And we just really wanted the you know, audience to see your faces and know that you are the people that um, can accompany the police to calls for service if they have to call the police. Um, it can be scary and intimidating to call the police during a mental health crisis and having um, one of these lovely ladies accompany the police um, you know, can bring a, a calming, um, compassionate presence. So um, let so thanks both of you for being here and I'll let Jay talk a little bit about his experience with the program. Good evening everyone, how you doing? My name is Jay Ball, I'm a police officer with the Framingham Police Department, uh, currently assigned uh, as a school resource officer at Framingham High School. Um, I can speak wholeheartedly for the Framingham Police that the jail diversion program works. Uh, corresponding with a clinician is just, it's so helpful. Uh, obviously, we have different generations of police officers across the country, across the state, and at the Framingham Police Department. Knowing that you can have a trained master's level clinician uh, driving around with you or they're ready to go to a call with you that to help in the event someone's having a mental health crisis is just uh, second to none. Um, I can think of a few scenarios uh, just in the past couple of weeks that will go into detail um, one actually with uh, Georgia, um, uh, we had an incident with a teenager. Um, we have a lot of runaways um, within the city of Framingham for whether they're someone at Wayside or, or actual resident of the city. And uh, this individual was having a, having a rough couple of days, um, it's fair to say contemplating suicide. Through the training that our officers like Caitlin uh, already mentioned, received just from being on a cruiser with uh, clinicians, we were able to de-escalate a situation and get Georgia to scene and Georgia takes over. Uh, and this is with every clinician we have. That training also showed when an officer, we could have a very volatile situation last week, um, an officer, officers were responding to a call where a person wanted, said they had a firearm and wanted to uh, complete suicide by police officer. Um, and I will say this as a police officer, it's the worst nightmare. Um, something I never want to be involved in, something I can say police officers do not want to be involved in. At that time, a uh, clinician could not get to scene. However, the officers that went to scene were level-headed. Actually, a rapport was formed by one of the officers in a previous encounter with the subject and Though that subject did have what appeared to be a firearm in his hand, the rapport that was gained, I believe a week before with that officer, de-escalated that situation and led to that person getting the treatment they needed without anyone being hurt. Now this is a perfect scenario. Um, obviously there's incidents that uh, don't end that way, but I think that collaboration between us uh, and advocates is just, is second to none. It just helps us as police officers complete our job and uh, we're learning and becoming, uh, I would say we're compassionate to begin with, but we're learning a lot and becoming more compassionate. Uh, so I just think it's, it's an absolute benefit and it's funny looking on social media and different places everywhere popping up, oh, this, this new thing co-responding. Well, it's an old thing. It's been going on in the city of Framingham, as Caitlin said, for 17 years and it, it just works. It's, it's a phenomenal program. 
Thanks, Jay. Um, we appreciate that. We appreciate our partnership with the Framingham Police. Um, and I also want to just say that if anybody in the community, um, you know, needs to, to or wants Georgia or Bonnie to respond to um, a call for service when they call the police, all you have to do is when you call the police, just say, you know, if the one of the clinicians is available, it'd be great if they could come. Um, it's as simple as that um, to access them. So that's um, that's our co-response program. Um, I guess, oh, go ahead, Adam. No, uh, thank you. You guys are uh, keeping right on schedule. So that's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, so I think now you're going to spend some time, you know, helping people to to know what signs to look for in terms of identifying people who are um, suffering from, you know, uh, mental health challenges. Yeah, so um, we, Jay, Jay and I teach um, mental health first aid, which we're gonna talk about in a little while. Um, and one of the things that's really helpful about that class is that it, it um, is able to teach individuals in the community um, as well as officers, we teach to officers about the signs and symptoms of mental health um, crisis and how and how do we help folks in, in those scenarios. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about signs and symptoms of mental different mental illnesses. Um, we obviously can't cover all of the mental health disorders that are uh, out there. There are many, um, but what we can talk about is how the there are some common themes uh, across the dis different disorders um, that in might indicate somebody is struggling with something. Um, so, you know, one of the common themes is changes in behavior. If you are um, a loved one, you notice a loved one's, you know, changing, um, just a simple thing. Maybe they're um, not doing activities they usually like to do, like running or exercising, um, maybe they're self-isolating, they're sort of withdrawing from family and friends. Um, those types of changes in behavior can be an indication that something um, is going on. Um, and all you have to do, you know, is be honest with somebody and say, hey, I noticed that this has changed. Um, is everything okay? Um, it really can be as simple as that to start the conversation. I know it can feel really scary to have a conversation with someone you love about their mental health, but um, it really can just be simple, as simple as that. And really being direct is the best approach to take. Um, some other things to look for with different mental illnesses are changes in appetite. So, um, you know, certainly with eating disorders, you would notice some appetite changes, but Beyond that, um, even people with depression and anxiety um, may be eating a lot less than they usually do, or maybe they're eating a lot more than they usually do because they're stress eating. Um, so changes in appetite can be a sign that something might be going on. Changes in sleep patterns is, again, um, something kind of common across the various different mental illnesses that are out there. Um, people with depression might sleep um, for hours and hours at a time more than they ever used to um, or people might not be able to sleep at all um, people who might have bipolar disorder and are experiencing mania um, they might have not slept for days and have all this energy um, that is like sort of unexplainable because how did how how do they have all this energy when they haven't slept um, but so those are some things that you can look for in your loved ones or in yourself and, and or your coworkers and, and be able to, you know, just say, hey, I observed, you know, that you, you haven't been eating much or it doesn't seem like you're sleeping well, you know, is everything okay? Um, and maybe they open up to you and maybe they don't, um, but at least you put yourself in that position to have a conversation. And if, you know, just the fact that you've started that conversation um, may make the person feel like they want to, you know, if they do want to talk about it, that they're going to come back to you because you took the initiative to start that conversation. Um, certainly some things to watch out for um, for somebody in a serious mental health crisis are um, suicidal ideation, um, you know, ide ideation to hurt others, um, 
those are important things to look out for. Again, with those types of things, you want to be direct. Um, you want to, you know, ask people directly if they're having thoughts of killing themselves. Um, it's best to be direct. You're not going to put the, the idea in somebody's head if they're thinking about it. They've been, they've already been thinking about it. If they're not, you're not going to change, you know, you know, you're not going to plant an idea in their head about that. Um, so being direct in these conversations is really always the best way to go. Um, some signs, um, some warning signs about people who are considering suicide um, include some of the things I've already mentioned, but also um, giving away things of value, um, important belongings that they have, um, saying, saying goodbye to people, friends or family. Um, those are some of the things that can be, um, you know, signs that somebody might be considering suicide. Um, so you definitely want, you know, to keep an eye out for those types of things. Um, again, like I said, just being direct when you're asking those questions and, and non-judgmental is the best way to go. Um, the other thing that you want to look out for too is somebody's ability to care for themselves, right? So um, sometimes people, their mental illness, you know, goes untreated and, and they get to a point where they really it's their symptoms are so severe that they are unable to care for themselves. Um, but, you know, maybe they're, they're not eating, they're not sleeping, they're not maintaining their hygiene, they're, you know, really in a tough place. Um, and so certainly that's when you'd want to reach out to some of the resources that we'll talk about later. Um, and, um, yeah, we'll let you, you know, we'll talk more about those different resources that are out there for Framingham specifically. Um, Jay, do you have anything for Bonnie or Georgia to add? <laughs> I'll defer to Bonnie and Georgia right now, and I will say some things, but uh, I figure I'll let the, the clinicians handle it if they'd like to jump in. I, I mean, I can, I'll just say that I think, Caitlin, you outlined um, things really nicely. And just to add, um, you know, we're available to talk through any of that. I think that sometimes Obviously, there, there are a number of resources and, um, you know, calling psychiatric emergency services or, um, you know, a number of the other resources in Framingham is an option, but um, we're here, our, our faces are right out there, particularly if there are safety concerns and you feel like, um, you know, the police may need to be involved, we're absolutely available um, just to kind of talk through whatever situation is happening. Um, you can bounce ideas off of us and we can sort of help to connect with what resource feels most appropriate in that moment. Um, so just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Bonnie. Caitlin, I'm going to break my own rule for a second here because somebody, somebody shy and um, emailed me a question um, <laughs> and, um, and it's just topical. So you've talked about um, like using non-judgmental language. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get a little more, you know, sort of examples of the kinds of things people can say because, this, you know, you, you said like specifically like don't be afraid that mentioning the word suicide is going to actually provoke it, but this person says, you know, they, they really have trouble with that. So what, do you have, can you give a little more advice on the things that you can say or should say? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, these conversations are hard regardless of the language you use, right? Um, it's not an easy conversation to have with, with family and friends. Um, but, you know, um, one of the things we talk about um, is using uh, I statements. So saying things like, I've noticed that, and then naming the behavior. So you're not accusing the person of, you know, instead of saying, you haven't been eating lately, saying, I've noticed you've been eating a little less than you usually do. Um, is that, are you feeling okay? Is everything okay? That makes it um, like an observation on your part rather than an accusation. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, you know, the other thing about being sort of non-judgmental and open having conversations like this is really body language can be really important. Um, sort of um, having an open body posture um, not sitting with your arms crossed or um, sitting down next to somebody rather than across from them. Sitting across from somebody is, can be very interrogative. Um, so sitting that, down next to somebody and, and, and having that conversation can just um, make you much more approachable for somebody to have 
to, you know, to be able to open up to you. Um, and, you know, just in, in terms of asking things about, you know, uh, thoughts of suicide, you want to be direct um, because if you say something like, are you having thoughts of harming yourself? Um, a person who's thinking about suicide might say, no, I'm not, but they're having thoughts of killing themselves and that's different. And so being direct is really important, even though it can feel really hard to, to say that out loud. Um, but it is um, definitely important. And, and then just as far as not being judgmental, um, you know, we don't want to, um, you don't want to make them feel bad about those feelings. You don't want to try to um, make them feel guilty, you know, tell them that, you know, that, they're, that their thoughts are selfish because they have family or those types of things. Um, somebody who's truly in that, in that dark space um, has accepted all of that. And, and so being sort of in that judgmental space with them is really not gonna be helpful. Um, you really want to um, see if they have a plan, see if they have means to carry out that plan. And then you wanna get them the help that they need um, through calling the police or psych emergency services um, as soon as possible. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> That does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just touch upon a couple of things, especially with that question and a follow up to Caitlin. Um, you know, when the police, when we show up, uh, and there's some things I'll say during our mental health first aid section, but when we show up, especially on a mental health call, um, we're looking to get the person the treatment they need. There may be direct questions asked, like Caitlin said, um, by us even. Through mental health first aid, we do come out are you thinking of killing yourself? As Caitlin already touched upon, um, you know, the, the hurting yourself. I'm, I'm, it's funny because in our class, I'll roll up a piece of paper and throw it and say, yeah, you're right. I'm not, I don't want to hurt myself, but I am thinking of killing myself. Well, do you have means? Do you have firearms? Uh, what do you do when I walk away? Direct questions. They may seem, you know, you know, intruding, but we're just trying to make sure people are safe, especially if we don't have a clinician at the time um, or if we're waiting for a clinician to come. Uh, another purpose of us being there too is to uh, make sure everyone's safe. Um, we'd rather stand right back, go you know right to our, our jail diversion clinician, let them step right in, and uh, and let them handle the situation. But just like in uh, any scene, um, take a step back and uh, make sure make sure it's safe. And uh, yeah, we'll cover some more in the mental health first aid section, but I just wanted to put that in there. Thanks, Jay. Adam, are there any other questions right now, or should we move on to mental health first aid? Oh, uh, just one question. Um, um, you know, some of the things you were talking about. I'm curious, like in the in the COVID era, how that's impacting the work that you do. You know, just thinking about like getting down on people's level or sitting next to them, and and how you know how much more difficult that's making your work. Um, or just, you know, what's going on? What are you, what are you seeing in Framingham in the area right now? Definitely, um, and Bonnie and Jay might be able to talk more specifically to the, that point, um, but our clinicians have been responding to calls through COVID with the police wearing masks and gloves, and it is hard. Um, you know, we, one of our goals on scene is to provide a compassionate presence and try to be, you know, try to de-escalate somebody and it's hard to do with a mask and you can only see you know somebody's eyes and and that that has made it challenging for sure um but um you know and, and the distance can be difficult certainly um for the clinicians um but i don't know if bonnie or jay you want to speak a little more to that i mean i can talk about my experience so as a co-responding clinician throughout the process, the, the, the COVID um, pandemic, you know, I think initially um, and throughout, really, one of the things we've, we've felt particularly proud of as a program is that we haven't stopped providing services to people um, because when people are in need, they're in need. So regardless of what's happening in the world, mental health crises are happening, there's stuff with substance abuse happening, so we, we never stopped. Um, we were, 
you know, continued in the departments, the departments that we work with. Um, and again, I work in Framingham, so specifically to Framingham, we were welcome to continue our work. Um, and, and it really felt like a true partnership in terms of navigating how do we keep us safe when we're entering a home? How do we make sure everyone else is safe? Um, so, you know, as I walk into a home um, and, and we're often in pretty sensitive situations, you know, if I'm wearing a mask, I, I do my best to be genuine all the time and, you know, just to sort of speak to the um, you know, the, the non-judgmental stance. I mean, when I enter a situation, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm a clinician. Yes, I'm trained to do an assessment, but I'm a, I'm a human being, I'm a person. And so that's how I approach everything. And, you know, how, how would I want, if I have someone coming into my home, how do I want them approaching me? You know, I don't want the clinical language. I don't want, you know, I, I want to talk to a human being. So it's been hard to do that again with you know, a mask on with having to maintain distance. You know, we do a lot of stuff that is um, not necessarily, you know, a, a call, calls that come in that are mental health related, yes, we respond to, but we do a lot of other things as well. Things aren't always coming in as mental health crises um, and, and we're there. So, um, you know, we, we've, we've found a way to do it. And, you know, honestly, sometimes we have the distance. Sometimes if I'm talking to someone and I see that, that, you know, they're not registering the what's happening with my eyes. I'll flip the mask down for a second. This is my face. This is what I look like. And I'll put it right back on because I think that can go a long way. Um, but, you know, we, we've really done our best to make sure that we've continued to, to be there for people. Um, and especially in the beginning when I think there was a huge fear about going to the emergency room. Um, you know, that was when I, I feel like, you know, we were really able to be there and say, yeah, we're going to divert. We're not going to go to the emergency room. You can be safely, uh, we can get you services in the community. Let's avoid that. Um, so, you know, it, I think our work has been particularly important in this time because there was just so much fear about going places. And so, as Caitlin mentioned in the beginning, one of our, one of the primary things that we do is divert from the emergency room. So we were really able to do that successfully um, throughout the whole process. And just to, to piggyback on Bonnie, um, there's been a lot of talk of us all getting the services. It seems like leaning towards sections and stuff. And as Bonnie uh, alluded to pretty much says with the diversion, um, it may be just for extra support the next day. It may be for extra support the week after. It may be a police officer showing up and saying, geez, can I, um, I'm going to, I'm going to call someone more. Is that cool? You know, we're talking to someone and I'll call Georgia. I'll call Bonnie. And I'll say, hey, can, um, can you follow up with this address? And what do they do the first thing they get into work? Georgia gets in or, or Bonnie gets in. They jump in a cruiser with an officer and they go straight up to the house. Or they may just make a phone call checking in on the person. It's not that every encounter with us or with uh, our jail diversion clinicians uh, are a trip to a section of the hospital. It may be just for support services. Um, so that's just something I just want to get out there. Uh, so people know if we come, it isn't, oh, it, it's, it's, you know, a trip to the hospital, obviously, as Bonnie just said, it isn't. Uh, so. Thanks guys. Um, I also, you know, want to, it just popped in my head while we were, while I was listening to you guys talk about, um, being non-judgmental during all this time. One of the easiest ways to be non-judgmental with somebody who's having a hard time is to validate what they're feeling. Um, so, you know, especially during COVID, um, you know, people were scared to go to the ER, but maybe they needed to for safety reasons. And for us to say, we understand that it might, or like, this must be really scary for you, or this must be really overwhelming for you and really validating what the person is feeling and what feelings they're expressing to you. Um, and that is what can be really helpful with family and friends as well when you're having those difficult conversations is to just validate what they're saying that way you're not you know passing judgment on what they're feeling you're just validating and saying you know I can see how that'd be really scary or really tough um a tough place to be so um I hope that answers the question <laughs> that was great thank you uh, and there's one other question maybe you could tackle now uh, about um, when, when people see somebody who they think might be having a mental health crisis, but it's not somebody they know, 
when it's appropriate to try and help a stranger versus intruding and in, you know into them their lives yeah no that's a really good question and i um you know i think especially in today's society i think kindness goes a long way um i think if you are you know walking down the street and you see somebody who um maybe looks like they're struggling maybe they are you know having a period of psychosis and they're talking to themselves and um clearly looks like they're sort of in some kind of distress i think you know if, if you're willing to say hey you know is everything okay you just wanted to check in um you know i think in today's world it, that can be a scary thing to do but it can also go a long way i think kindness um and and reaching out um to our neighbors and our you know our community members um in that way can be um really powerful um and impactful um to just for somebody to think wow that person doesn't even know me and they care about what um what i might be going through um you know alternatively certainly somebody could respond negatively and um you know tell you to go buzz off and that's <laughs> what it is um but you know certainly i think can, when you ask this question adam what um I, one um situation came to mind um when i was working in Framingham. Um, on the four to 12 shift, there was a, a gentleman that was sort of pacing back and forth on a um, overpass uh, over Route 9 and somebody stopped and, and uh, like pulled over on the, on the overpass and, and talked to him and, um, you know, he was contemplating jumping. Um, and so that interaction stopped that from happening. Um, and so it's you know it can be difficult more difficult to intervene with strangers um but it never hurts to just check in you know giving somebody a smile and saying how's your day going how, how are you doing um i think that can can go a long way yeah you know I'd, I'd like to think that maybe that will be one positive that comes out of this whole challenging situation that maybe will it'll nudge us to be a little more comfortable reaching out to strangers in a positive way to check on how they're doing or, you know, it just, it seems like normally the only times we interact with strangers is when we're, you know, pissed at them for cutting us off or, or they're taking too long in front of you or something like that. So, if, you know, I think it takes courage, you know, to, to show that kind of kindness and, and these challenging situations, I think can help with that. Um, all right. Well, I think we should move on to the next section, which is about mental health first aid. Um, I did want to encourage people who are in, uh, if you want to post questions in the chat, we will come back to some more uh, questions and answers in a little while. Yeah, so mental health first aid um, was designed in Australia in 2001. It is an evidence-based um, curriculum. It, um, that mean, just means that there were randomized controlled trials um, that say that teaching the class works. Um, people take away from it what, what they're supposed to. Um, it was meant, it was designed to be a similar to a medical first aid course. So, you know, anybody in the community can sign up to take CPR and first aid and, um, you know, it's basic. CPR and first aid is basic, right? It's not, um, you know, uh, advanced medical support that you're learning to provide. It's the basics until EMS can arrive um, and take over. So mental health first aid was designed to be that for mental health. So, um, you know, really just to teach members of the community how to identify signs and symptoms of mental illness and how to help. Um, and so it takes, the class takes you through um, different mental illnesses um, and sort of applies a um, an acronym, uh, it's the, the algae action plan is what it's called. Um, and it takes you through the steps of the algae action plan for each different diagnosis that the class talks about. Um, in 2008, um, the US uh, sort of adopted the mental health first aid. Um, it's very widespread. It's put on through the National Council for Behavioral Health. Um, and they've developed all kinds of modules for mental health first aid. So there are, you know, classes for just the community. There are um, classes for teens. There are classes for um, 
first responders. Jay and I teach specifically the public safety class, um, specifically to police. Um, part of the um, International Association of uh, Police Chiefs, um, part of their One Mind campaign that they started a few years back um, was sort of this challenge to police departments to um, train a percentage of their officers in crisis intervention training or CIT, and then to train 100% of their department, including dispatchers in mental health first aid for public safety. So um, through our training and technical assistance center, we've been funded through the Department of Mental Health to provide these trainings to police across the state. So um, your Framingham Police Department, uh, with the exception of the newer officers who are signed up for future classes, um, the rest of the department has been trained in mental health first aid. So they have all learned some of those skills um, from Jay and I. And um, if you want, uh, I'm gonna let Jay talk about his experience with mental health first aid and why he got involved teaching with me. But um, if you're interested in taking a class, um, like I said, the class Jay and I teach is specifically for police, but they offer community classes and you can go to mentalhealthfirstaid.org and um, find a class, you know, you enter your zip code and find a class near you. They are, are offering virtual options um, at this point. So you can um, look into that when, when you're on the website. So uh, let Jay talk a little bit about his part in all of this. How I came involved. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. People know me as certain things. I'm a police officer for almost 17 years. Before that, I was in the uh, United States Army. Um, a lot of friends across the world in policing and the military. And um, I, I come across that guy. Oh, he's, you know, he's this. He's a police officer. But I've always, in the back of my head, had a, uh, uh, I don't know if a like's a good word, like towards, uh, you know, helping people with mental health issues. Um, it's become a big part of our job as police officers. Um, I think it always has. I just think it's been brought to the forefront over the past, you know, five to 10 years. So I ended up going to a class uh, where Caitlin was one of the instructors, sitting in a class with a bunch of police officers. Uh, isn't fun sometimes for police officers, never mind if you're the one in front of the class. And Caitlin was doing a phenomenal job with her co-instructor. And as I'm sitting there, it just something hit me in my head. And I said, you know what? I'd love to teach this. I love um, talking and I love learning and uh, uh, I love in instructing in subjects that I like. And uh, mental health first aid just seemed like something I want to be involved in. And I grabbed Caitlin and I said, hey, would you ever let a police officer teach this with you? You know, you're the professional, you're the clinician, but maybe if we brought some real life scenarios and real life, you know, put things on, on, on police officers saying, listen, this may be happening in your life, whether it's yourself, a family member, um, something you see on the street every day, we can do things better. Um, and to my surprise, uh, they were very receptive to it. And uh, I went to the, uh, the, we call it the train the trainer uh, to become an instructor. And I've been doing it for almost two years now with, with Caitlin uh, Advocates. Um, and this wasn't done on my own. Uh, it was my own thought, however, uh, going to the uh, to Chief Ferguson back then, then to Chief Trask, and now uh, Acting Chief Brandolini, the support has been uh, phenomenal. There is even a question. Um, at least one Wednesday every month, I go to a police department with Caitlin, and uh, we teach uh, first responders. And one thing I get across to everyone is, not only are police officers in the class, but uh, dispatchers. And the big thing I try and get across to even police officers, especially, you know, it doesn't matter if you're new or old. Before we, as police officers, go to a call, it could be a horrendous call. Uh, I won't get into specifics, but the first person that takes that call is a dispatcher. They hear the stress on the other side of the line. They may be talking to someone uh, through helping a loved one. Um, and, and we need to remember that the dispatchers are going through it just as much as the officer getting there. That 30 seconds that that dispatcher spends on that 911 line is an eternity, especially if someone's having uh, a life-changing incident on the other line. Uh, medical emergencies, violent situations, or, or, or mental health issues. So getting in front of the police and letting them know that, uh, you know, I'm here, I'm telling you, um, as a police officer, 
these things have happened. These things have happened in my life. We've had a whole career and I kind of, best way of pointing it is isolate it to ourselves and saying, we started this job. We went through backgrounds. We went through, you know, psychological and medical. We started this job squared away the best I can say, but over the years, things happen and not to be afraid. It's not 30 years ago. Police officers shouldn't be afraid of saying, listen, this affected me. Okay. Uh, this awful situation uh, involving X, Y, and Z affected me and they shouldn't be afraid of losing the job. I start out the class and there's a, um, you know, there's a strict format um, that we follow with the class, but I start out the class and I ask everyone, if I dropped right now of a heart attack, what would you do? And I get these blank stares like, Oh God, this, he's going to make me answer a question. Yeah. I'm going to make you answer a question. And everyone's like, well, you know, there's a joke here there. Well, if one person doesn't like me, they'll let me go. But the big thing is everyone says they're going to give me CPR. They're going to go get me an AED. They're going to call 911. They're going to get me medical help. Then I say, okay, what happens if I just have some sort of mental health emergency right now? What are you going to do? And the blank stares come again. And I think it's at that point at the beginning of our eight hour class, it's that transition in their minds going, yeah, if someone loses a limb or has a heart attack, we're running, we're rushing in to save the day. But what if someone, a brain's a part of our body? It's an emergency. Um, why aren't we treating that the same way? And I think over that next eight hours that Caitlin and I are talking to them, where we bring in certain stories that have happened in our lives, um, not being afraid to tell uh, people things, I just think that trains, you know, trains the community of first responders into how to deal with that and working with our partners um, who are clinicians, who are mental health professionals, because um, we can't do it alone. Um, we don't want to do it alone. So I just think mental health first aid and getting everyone trained in this, whether it's their personal lives, whether it's their public lives, whether, you know, any part of their lives, I just think it's a, it's a very important um, program and that's why i've bought into it and uh, i just i love doing it i actually look forward to it every, every time we get to teach so thanks jay um having jay be my co-instructor has added so much validity to the message we are trying to get across to first responders police specifically in the class um you know he has personal experience and you know as a clinician who's worked alongside police. I have personal experience with different calls as well that I can discuss, but um, police like to hear from police on <laughs> certain things. So um, that goes um, a long way to have him as my co-instructor. And um, I think we do a pretty good job with that. So I see some questions over here. Um, one hey, of them is- Helen, hey, oh. before, I'm just gonna interrupt you, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Mayor Spicer for joining us now. Thank you very much. Um, are you able to stay with us till the end or okay? All right, so we'll be coming back to you later on. So thank you for, for joining us. Um, all right, uh, yeah, Caitlin, if you wanna take a, a couple of those questions and then um, we can uh, move to our next segment. Okay, sure. Um, so one of the questions is how long do you, rem do you recommend having symptoms before seeking help from a therapist? Um, this is different for different, so first of all, I'll say that the, you know, it's different for the different types of mental illnesses that are out there, but really what you're looking for is, um, and this kind of goes along with another question about the difference between regular day-to-day -day blues or stress um, versus a mental health issue, um, is really about your ability to function in your day-to-day -day life. So. How much is, are the symptoms you're having impacting your day-to-day -day, um, ability to, you know, get up and take a shower and go to work and um, interact interact with your friends and your significant other, or your family? Um, you know, if if it's not really impacting those things, you might not need to to reach out for professional help, um, or you might, um, you know. Professional help is can be really helpful for day-to-day -day stress. Also, um, it just you know can be helpful to talk to somebody about the stressors in your life. That is a biased third party, right? Um, not a family or family member or friend. So, 
I think that professional help can be helpful just for the day-to-day -day stress that doesn't necessarily indicate a mental health issue. Um, but really, when you're looking at the difference, it's, a, it's about how, long, how much is it impacting your life and how long has it been impacting your life for, right? So, um, you know, when somebody experiences a trauma, um, they may have acute stress disorder, which is very time limited. So it's the symptoms are for a brief period of time after the trauma, um, and and it's limited to that. If it extends past that time frame, then we're looking at um, maybe there's you know more post traumatic stress happening here. Um, but it's sort of about the in the the. Um, DSM-5 or the Diagnose, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which sort of guides all of these types of diagnoses, um, has sort of criteria for the timelines of that type of stuff. But it's really about the impact on your functioning. Um, so I hope that answers those questions. Um, somebody asked, do the observations of people in crisis look different in different stages of life? Child, young adult, teenager, adult, senior citizen, et cetera. Um, and yes, they definitely can look different. So for instance, a, you know, a child who's experienced trauma, um, their, their symptoms of that trauma are gonna look very different than an adult's um, most likely, um, especially depending on the age of the child, right? They are going to act out probably more behaviorally um, with, you know, throwing things or hitting people or um, rebelling, um, that's gonna definitely be more their way of acting out because they don't know how to process the way an adult might. Um, so there's definitely different, different things that come out um, depending on the different stages of life that, that you might be in. Um, but a lot of the, um, again, a lot of the themes that I talked about earlier are gonna be present throughout the different stages of, of the lifespan. Okay, I think we can- doing? How am come, I doing, Adam? <laughs> you're doing great, uh, you're okay. both doing great. I think we will come back to questions. Um, and I wanna encourage folks who are in uh, the Zoom to post the questions in the chat, or um, I'm people are, shy or people are emailing me, which is fine as well. Um, <laughs> And I'll try and keep an eye on, on Facebook here and there because um, we do have a lot of people watching on Facebook. Okay. Um, but I did want to take a few minutes and talk about some of the City of Framingham resources and then also have you um, talk about some of your resources and we'll, we'll come back to questions. So, because when I announced uh, that we were doing this, um, people reached out to me to say, hey, you know, by the way, I got help from this person. Um, these people have been amazing over the years and I wanna make sure we acknowledge that work. Um, uh, first of all, there's Kelly Hagerty who works with the fire department. Uh, if folks are calling, you know, uh, 911 with emergencies often, um, you know, it's being moved to the fire department and, and Kelly um, is a crisis intervention specialist. So if somebody's facing a mental health crisis, she um, is often heading immediately out there and, and uh, sort of helping people it seems like 24 seven. Um, a second person is Kitty Mahoney, who is, um, you know, amazing and has been amazing in Framingham for, for years and years. Uh, she's our chief public health nurse. And during this uh, COVID crisis, um, uh, not just about mental health, but she's been doing incredible work to, to keep the city of Framingham healthy. And, and um, I'm sure, you know, Mayor Spicer, um, can talk about her great work as well. But I heard from a bunch of people like you got to talk about Kitty Mahoney. Uh, the Callahan Center um, for our seniors, they have um, two licensed clinical social workers on their staff and they're available um, by phone um, throughout the, the day to have brief counseling sessions with folks. And so um, some seniors had mentioned that they've had friends who've reached out to them um, and they were really helpful. And then lastly, Framingham Public Library, you know, they've been doing a great job sort of reinventing themselves. And, and you know, while this crisis was going on and the libraries were inaccessible, making sure that they were reaching out in different ways, when, you know, whether it comes to books or um, with mental health resources. And I know um, Marcy Majorana in particular has put together a, a great list of resources on the Framingham Public Library um, website that people can access. 
And so um, I think that, you know, one of the reasons why I think, you know, this webinar and if we can keep doing events like this are so important is because the resources are out there. We just have to make sure that people are aware of what they are. And, uh, and I know that uh, Caitlin and Jay are gonna talk a little more about resources. And again, folks, feel free to post questions in the chat or um, send them uh, email or Facebook and we will come back to questions in um, a little while, so. Thanks, Adam. Um, so there are, Framingham is a great place to be for resources for mental health and substance use um, issues. They, it's very rich, Framingham is very rich in resources, which is so great. Um, I'll let Jay talk a little bit um, about veterans resources in a minute, but I'll just sort of highlight some of the ones. Um, I put together a resource list and Adam's going to share that um, with participants um, in various ways um, when we're done. Um, but I'll just go through and highlight a few of them. Certainly, um, sort of the two big um, providers for mental health services um, is our advocates and Wayside Youth and Family. Um, they, Wayside Youth and Family does a lot of great work with youth and their families, um, as the name says, um, but we um, you know, really collaborate with them a lot um, for in-home therapy and things like that. Advocates, again, has a, a wealth of services, um, outpatient services, substance services, uh, deaf services, autism services. Um, I'm sure I, I won't be able to list them all off the top of my head, but it's very um, robust. So those are two big ones for Framingham. Um, there's a lot of great peer resources um, in Framingham. Um, we have Advocates has the Living Room, which um, is operated by um, certified peer specialists who um, have lived experience with mental illness or substance use, um, and people can make an appointment right now through COVID. It used to be they could just drop in, but through COVID, I think they have to make an appointment right now, but you can just, you know, make an appointment and go in and talk to somebody about what's been going on and having that lived experience um, can be really helpful to get people to open up and talk about what's going on with them. Um, you know, we have SMOC um, has a wealth of resources also, um, or the Southern Middlesex Opportunity Council. Um, they also um, won the Voices Against Violence, which is really important for people suffering with domestic issues. Um, there are a lot of first responder resources um, that, are, that are out there that are on the um, resource list. Um, and then certainly um, the crisis resources like psychobatic psych emergency services, um, Wayside Mobile Crisis for Youth, the National Suicide Hotline. Um, one thing that I really wanna highlight is the Behavioral Health Partnership of Metro West. Um, that is on the Framingham City webpage, I noticed. Um, but that referral line, if you call them, um, they can, they're connected to advocates, SMOC, Spectrum Health Systems and Wayside Youth and Family. And so you call and tell them what's going on and they're gonna direct you to where to go because it can be so overwhelming to go on and look at what services are out there and which one's best for me. And um, Behavioral Health Partners of Metro West really did a nice collaboration to be able to point people in the right direction when, when they call. Um, so we'll get that all that out to you. Um, there are great opiate resources in Framingham, uh, Framingham Force. Um, the JRI RISE program, um, Learn to Cope is great for family members of people with opiate resource, you know, people who have loved ones who are dealing with opiate issues. Um, Framingham State has some great resources, uh, mental health resources and other kinds of resources as well for black, indigenous and people of color. Um, and then of course, you know, there's SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the National Council for Behavioral Health are all full of, if you go to their website, COVID resources, um, you know, all, all these places have, um, you know, COVID updates and resources and different places you can go for different things. So we'll make sure we get all those resources out to you. It's certainly not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, we tried to cover um, as many as we could 
And I'll let Jay briefly just uh, talk to you about the veterans resources that are available in Framingham. All right, just uh, one thing that jumps in my mind is uh, up at the Edwards Church, um, there's uh, counseling for veterans up there. Um, you can get through them. You can call up the Edwards Church through Vet Sync. Uh, you can also, uh, through the Vietnam Vet, even though it's the title is the Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, Carol Callan, Callahan uh, runs that on a Marlboro. She can, is, a, is a great wealth of uh, services for veterans. Um, we've talked a lot about diversion uh, and keeping people out of, uh, out of custody. That shouldn't be the end of the road. Sometimes, unfortunately, people are arrested. People are charged uh, with crimes. In Middlesex County, we're, we're, it's, it's such a great thing. We have not only a recovery court, which I'll explain in a second, we also have a veterans treatment court. They're both housed at the Framingham District Court for Middlesex County. Um, sometimes people come to me and say, oh, geez, veterans are getting away with it. Sometimes I would rather go through a regular court to, to do what these veterans uh, have to do in veterans court. Uh, it's a very structured environment. Um, you're only let in for certain types of uh, offenses, but it's, it's th therapeutic. Therapy, working through problems. Um, most of the, the veterans that are involved, they do come from all over Middlesex County. The big thing is the substance use, uh, along with an underlying mental health issue. They work through that. It's not your traditional uh, uh, court setting. Uh, and I've been involved in that with Lieutenant uh, Downing uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, just the support we give these veterans, uh, the clinicians have, um, is it, just phenomenal. Uh, so I will put this out to everyone. If you have a loved one that's a veteran, unfortunately is in the criminal justice system, um, it's something you should look into. If they could use the uh, help, whether it be substance and or mental health, uh, that would be great. As for recovery court, another thing, Middlesex County, uh, they, they hold it in Framingham District Court. Um, helping people who do have problems with uh, substance abuse. I was a detective for many years, a lot between here and uh, a town in Worcester County dealing with straight, straight with narcotics. Um, having people who are using and are addicted, not to get too far down that road, but there are uh, resources through the court uh, where you can talk to your uh, attorney about going into recovery court. Uh, once again, it's, it's treatment-based. Both courts are treatment-based. Um, it's not a free ride. It's not getting out of, oh, I don't have to go to district court. You, you get the help that you want. Um, so I just think those are, those are two great things that we have for people that unfortunately do have charges uh, against them uh, in the court system. And it's great that you know Middlesex is a, is a large county. Uh, but we're lucky here in Framingham that we have those two courts for the entire county here. Um, I hope we never lose them. I hope they keep going. I hope more specialty courts come out, uh, especially in Middlesex County. Um, not being selfish to Middlesex alone, but it's the county we're in. Uh, but there are also veterans courts in other counties across. Right now, there isn't one in Worcester County. I know we're real close to Worcester County, uh, but other districts have different specialty courts. Um, and just keep a reminder, um, the Edwards Church, uh, some counseling up there. And it could be just for maintenance. It doesn't um, mean you're in a crisis. It could be just for some maintenance. So there are things out there for veterans and uh, I'll provide my email address. I have no problem. Uh, and I, I can help out any which way pointing people in the right directions, specifically veterans needs. Yeah, certainly um, if anybody has any, um, you know, questions about resources that aren't on the list. Um, if I'm able to help you find them, uh, I will point you in that direction so I can put my email address in the chat um, as well, just so people can contact me if they, if they need assistance looking for other services. Um, so, I think. Thank you. All right, well, there are um, a few questions um, and actually uh, comment uh, Eileen Davis mentioned that the Metro West Regional Coalition for Suicide Prevention and Call to Talk are able to underwrite costs associated with mental health first aid. Um, so it sounds like if somebody's interested in participating in that program, they, there's some financial help out there, uh, which is great. Thank you, Eileen. Um, 
And let's see. Maybe I'll start at the bottom and work my way back up. Um, and, and actually, I'll, I'll jump the line, too, because I had a, a, a question that I can't wait to ask. So um, I'm curious about um, folks with disabilities who other, you know, mental health challenges, but combined with other disabilities like autism spectrum disorder or um, developmental delays or cognitive issues, uh, you know, if there's uh, particular strategies or, or or what sort of challenges that presents um, and, and what sort of things can the family members of, of folks in that situation, um, what is it good to know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, certainly in Framingham, there are a, a, an array of autism services. Um, Advocates um, is, is, has autism services. The Autism Alliance um, is huge. Also sort of right next door in Southboro um, is the New England Center for Children. Um, They're an autism uh, school and re research uh, center. One thing we tell family members um, of kids, especially kids with autism, um, who may need to call the police during a, you know, a crisis, um, is that you can have um, your address sort of flagged in the police system as um, an address where if it's possible, if you, you know, for the police to come without the lights and sirens, um, you know, certainly there are some cases where they can't do that, but, you know, if they can, they will turn them off so that, you know, that stimulation doesn't um, escalate things more. That can be a big, um, a big trigger for folks with autism. Um, so we can, you know, have addresses flagged that'll pop up when the call comes in and say, hey, you know, this family has somebody with autism and it can, you know, these are some, maybe these are some things that, you know, also families can tell us, tell the clinicians to Bonnie or Georgia, they can say, hey, you know, um, if you have to come to the house, these are some things that help de-escalate my son or my daughter or my brother or wh whoever it is, um, so that we, you know, know um, some ways that we can try and help in the moment when we're there. Um, I don't know, Bonnie or Jay, do you have Bonnie, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I can just add that, and I and I saw in one of one of the questions was related to um, if you know if someone's called the police and they talk to a clinician, um, you know, is that like public record? Um, I, I I just want to I think talk a little bit about the partnership that we have and sort of how it works. Um, so. We partner with the Framingham Police Department. So as an advocates clinician, I'm in the cruiser and you know it, we're going on a call and the police have, may have some information about what has happened in the home or what has happened with the individual that we're responding to. But we have our own um, uh, electronic health record. So a lot of times what happens is um, you know, if someone has called the police because there's a need for a response for whatever's happening with that person, we're able to look that person up in our electronic health record and, and see if we have any history with them. And so I always encourage family members to, um, you know, if they have, if, if there's a, you know, if you have a child um, who's on the autism spectrum or um, even, you know, sort of a, a a parent who's aging and you're concerned about some cognitive delays that are happening and you know you want to just sort of put them on the radar we're always happy to to add that information into our record so that um you know if if the person if the address or the person's name pops up we can collaborate with the police and say hey why don't you send me on that i'd love to be involved in that i have some history with that person i you know i, I think i can help um and and the the framingham police are always is um, ready, willing, and able to pick us up and bring us over, um, particularly if it's going to be helpful for whatever call they're going on. Um, and the other side of that, too, is that because, um, you know, because the assessment, the psychiatric assessment that we do, uh, the comprehensive assessment is pretty extensive, um, but it's, it's protected health information. So, any conversation that I have now, again, conversations that we have, if the police are involved, are alongside a police officer. So, um, you know, the the information is usually sort of open in front of everyone. But 
what happens in my assessment is that I write it all up and then that's not police record. You know, I may be asking some really intimate details about, you know, history, family history, substance use history, things that people are sometimes cautious about saying in front of a police officer and, and working alongside the police. Um, I see time and time again, officers say, I'm going to take a step back. You could, I, I, I don't need to know that. That's okay. You can, you can say that to the clinician. I'm not worried about your drug history. I'm not worried about, you know, what the, that, that's not why we're here. And they're very respectful of the privacy of people. Um, and so when I write up an assessment, I always say to people, this is your protected health information. I can't share this with, you know, if, if let's say um, a family member called in you know, and wanted wanted us to check on their loved one. I'm not necessarily calling that loved one or that the family member and saying, "Hey, I talked to your loved one. This is what they said." It's a you know, like I'm I'm bound by sort of those laws of of protecting people's privacy. So, um, so so any clinical assessment that happens is not a police record. It doesn't mean that there's not a record that that the police were at the house or that there's not a report written by the police officer, but what we do, the assessment we do and referrals for services that we make is not public record. That's, that's very private. If I can say, um, you know, one thing to follow up on that, um, it's, as I said in the outset, I can't speak for any other police department, but uh, in Framium, having the clinicians and having the uh, jail diversion co-responding unit, whatever we want to call it, uh, it's a culture. And as Bonnie said, yes, we, we'll take a step back. This is not, uh, unless there's something else going on simultaneously, it's not a criminal issue at the time. So when she says officers will step back and officers won't listen, um, it, it's, it's not part of anything we need to know about. We're there. We let them handle what they need to do. And it's, like I said, it's a culture of what we've done. Uh, I've only been here, transferred seven years, but the day you start, you know, advocates is here and that we work with them so thank you thank you uh there was a quick question is, is the city still using smart 911 jd now yeah yes we are uh still using smart 911 which is uh i'm not an expert at by any means um uh but you can from what i know you can create a profile and uh, when you dial them, one that profile is uh, seen to the dispatcher uh, in the uh, the piece of the the access point where the 911 calls in. Um, and you can go on to uh, uh, Smart 911 and make your own profile. Uh, if there's some medical emergencies, or as Caitlin said, some people have, I can't guarantee that lights and sirens won't be on in some of those calls, like Caitlin said. But those are things you can request. Uh, obviously, there are times when, by policy and by law. Um, we have to respond with lights and sirens. Um, but there's different things you can list in there on the smart 911 that will be uh, available to the uh, call taker and dispatcher. Great. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about whether there are support groups for various issues you can recommend, or can you point people to a resource for support groups? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it does depend on what what the issue, what you're talking about um, is. Um, certainly for um, substance use, they have, um, you know, not only do they have the, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, but they have support groups for families, um, such as Al-Anon. Um, you can go and, and look up those websites and they'll give you, you know, meeting times in your area. Um, Learn to Cope is a really great support group for um, family members of individuals who struggle with opiate use. Um, Jay and I have talked at a couple of their meetings. Um, it's, it's a great, uh, great support group. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI as it's referred to, um, they have a lot of support groups for people um, experiencing mental illness and also um, people um, you know, who support loved ones with mental illness. Um, I also think in one of my, one of my resources on one of my pages, um, I believe it was the Transformation Center um, is a resource that, uh, it's a website um, that you can go to and it has um, different um, uh, 
support groups for different um, issues, um, mostly peer run. Um, but again, that can be where the best support comes from uh, with a lot of these things. Um, when you have that person who's got lived experience to share you know, how they got through it, that can be more helpful than anything um, that a professional could say. So um, the peer support groups are, are really um, important. Um, we have peer support stuff at Advocates. Um, and so those are, those are some things I would recommend. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question. Can you handle a mental health emergency by yourself? Do you just go to the hospital emergency room or to Wayside? So, um, I guess I'm not sure, is it by yourself, like your own emergency or somebody else's emergency? I'm not sure, I guess I can just speak to both. Um, certainly if you're you know, having your own mental health emergency, um, we would not recommend that you drive yourself anywhere to the emergency room. That can be dangerous. Um, we would recommend that you call um, psych emergency services or um, call 911 and request an ambulance or a, a clinician. Um, because like I said, we don't want people to drive while they're in the middle of a crisis. Um, but for, you know, loved ones, certainly if you, you know, if, uh, you know, your sibling, you know, an, an adult sibling or a child is experiencing a mental health crisis um, and you're comfortable to drive that person to, um, you know, the emergency room for an evaluation, you certainly are welcome to do that. Um, you know, but we calling advocates or calling Wayside Youth and Family um, allows the opportunity for you to not have to go to the emergency room because we can do telehealth evaluations right now with COVID, you know, we're able to do evaluations via Zoom or even just on the phone um, to try to de-escalate folks and, and sort of keep them out of the emergency room. Um, but certainly, um, you know, if people are comfortable bringing a loved one to the ER and there's no safety concerns um, about doing so, it's certainly an option um, if you're comfortable with that. Thank you. Um, on your list of resources, you have um, some crisis resources. Um, is there one, you know, there's advocates, 24 seven call line, Wayside, National Suicide Prevention, call to talk. Is there one that you think, you know, should be the first number people call or, um, I mean, I guess you're with advocates. But, uh, <laughs> maybe you would. I, I am, um, you know, I think, it does depend. So, you know, if you have a child who's in crisis, Wayside, you know, youth and family, Wayside Mobile Crisis might be the best number to call because they deal specifically with youth, right? Certainly, um, Advocates is capable of handling that. We, we contract with Wayside for youth evaluations. So we, you know, can certainly do a, a youth assessment. Um, but, you know, if I had a child who was in crisis, that would probably be the first number I would reach out to that's what they do, um, you know, and certainly it, it sort of, um, I think depends on your comfort level, um, you know, with the national hotlines and the call to talk, they have, um, you know, like Spanish option or a TTY option. So you can have that um, access if you, um, that we don't necessarily have at Advocates um, all the time. Sometimes, it, you know, we can use language lines and things like that, but the national hotlines are more equipped to handle that type of stuff. But even set, even calling, say, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, um, that could end up with a call to the police and a officer and a co-response clinician coming out to see somebody, because if somebody says that you know, to a national suicide prevention lifeline worker that they, you know, are suicidal and they have a plan and they have access to carry out their plan, um, you know, they're going to get in touch with the police um, so that we can go over and, and make sure that person is safe. So, um, however you are most comfortable getting the help that you need or that your loved one needs um, is the way I, that's how I would say to, um, you know, to go. <laughs> um, and certainly if there's an immediate safety issue, um, we always encourage people to call 911 in, in those instances. Mm. Has the, the field of mental health moved into the whole telehealth um, way of doing things that I've seen like 
I know there's like a medical doctor who makes me come in once a year um, and it's just like sitting there and waiting and then like a two minute visit. And, you know, as soon as I heard about a telehealth appointment, I was like, all right, like this is going to save me time. And then we can actually spend more time talking to each other rather than waiting in a waiting room. Is that something that that's allowed now? Are people doing therapy and services through telehealth? And will that stick around once, once life gets back to normal? Cause I, I'm, I'm a big fan of telehealth. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question and um, the real um, determinant of whether it will, it will stick around after the pandemic ends is about how insurance decides whether or not they're going to continue to cover telehealth for mental health services. Um, currently, you know, when, once the pandemic started, um, all insurances across the board said absolutely recovering telehealth, even you know, if people didn't have access to video chat, just talking to somebody on the telephone was, was being covered to assess safety because um, we didn't have any other way to do that, right? And so they felt like if that was the only way to get people the help they needed, then, then they had to do that. Um, as far as I know, that, that, that status hasn't changed because um, we are still in the middle of the pandemic, but it could definitely, um, stay or go <laughs> it's a really uh, unfortunately uh, sort of dictated by insurance from my understanding um you know with mental health um the telehealth you know can be convenient especially if folks have difficulty with transportation but um one thing we've noticed is that you know it's a lot harder to pick up on body language and different cues with somebody when you're on a video platform or definitely on just a telephone um, than it is to be in that person, you know, for us as crisis clinicians, we want to, we want to be out in the community seeing folks because we want to see what their environment looks like. We want to, you know, um, see who else is in the home and how is that impacting things. And so doing that through telehealth really takes away a lot of that and that makes it harder to sometimes get to the real you know issue as to what the underlying thing that's going on um but um certainly it has been helpful for the current situation that we're in so definitely if and i could I, oh sorry if i could just say one thing um, absolutely um there's different companies out there as as strange as it may sound i have a couple of friends that are uh clinicians actually aren't with advocates but they uh do text um text therapy is as strange as it sounds um but it's not for someone in an emergency obviously but uh different things uh i'm like i see him doing something one day he's like all oh, confidentiality but he's actually texting with a client um through these platforms um one being talk space i uh, know nothing about them so i'm not advertising for them but i just one of the companies and uh it, it just it was amazing to see he speaks multiple languages too. So he was actually fielding um, therapy texts from other countries. Uh, so it was just, it was just phenomenal to see, obviously not doing an emergency and there's disclaimers to that, but um, some people just needing, you know, that little bit of, uh, for lack of a better word, maintenance or just to talk, you know? Absolutely. Um, and while you both were talking, I was just, it was kind of in the back of my head. I know that I think, um, all three of the members of our state delegation, um, Jack Lewis, uh, Marie Robinson, and Carmen Gentile, are supporting a bill to actually make sure that in, or require insurance companies to to pay for tele telephone mental health or telehealth for mental health services. So um, I think that's still in committee, but as far as I know, they're they're working to get that passed. So. Uh, all right, we have two. Uh, just my clock just switched, so we have one more minute. Maybe we can take one more question in here. Or is there anything you wanted to add before we? Um, Mayor Spicer is going to wrap things up for us. But um, Jay or Kaylin, or do you want to need to grab another question? I want to thank everyone for having us. Um, it was you know great to be here with all of you and share the information and knowledge that we have. Um, I think. Jay and I both put our email addresses in the chat, so please feel free to reach out to us with any uh, lingering questions or, you know, resources that we might have missed that you need help finding, um, and we'll do what we can to assist. And I just want to echo that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, five years ago, I don't think I didn't think I'd be sitting on a mental health panel, but I, I truly uh, um, 
love doing it. I love working with advocates, Caitlin, Bonnie, Georgia, everyone over there, Sarah. Um, uh, everyone's great. Uh, my email is up there. Uh, just so everyone knows, I am a police officer, uh, but I'm also a human being also. Um, it is a public email. So if you say, geez, Jay Ball, could, uh, could you give me a call? And if I could point someone in the right direction, veteran, anyone, doesn't need to be a veteran, but if I could point anyone in the right direction, I may hand you right over the, to advocates, to, to someone else, but um, say, hey, could you give me a call at this number? And that's great um, uh, because I'm a person first, police officer second, okay? Um, and that's, I just want people to know that. Thank you. And thank you to Caitlin and Jay. You guys did an amazing job and I appreciate you taking time out of you know your evening to, to join us. Um, and there was so much information provided here. Um, and let me also thank uh, Cheryl who's been quiet over there, hiding in the background, but Cheryl Goldstein really, you know, this was her brainchild that she, um, she recognized this need that's an ongoing need. So thank you to her as well. And to all the folks who joined us on, on Zoom and Facebook and elsewhere. And, uh, and, uh, and Bonnie as well, thank you for joining us and giving us some, some great answers. Um, so now um, I'm happy that Mayor Spicer is able to join us. Um, she was here for a while listening in and um, wanted to give you, you know, a, a chance to, to wrap up for us, um, Mayor Spicer. And you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Good evening, all, and uh, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, you know, one of the things that it's important to take uh, take a step back and take a deep breath. And I can't thank you all enough as a panel uh, to to not only share your expertise but to share your humanity uh, with our community. And as as many of you know, I mean, over the last several months, this has been a tumultuous time for all of us. And, and, and in many ways, people have been traumatized in more ways than one. And, uh, you know, when you think about everything that we've had to go through to stay physically safe and healthy, uh, our mental health and, uh, and, and parents that are home, homeschooling with their children and, and trying to, uh, you know, pivot their work and, um, and manage, a, a, you know, the parents that they have to care for. Um, and then also some of the reality of loss, loss in our community. Um, I just appreciate you all taking a little more uh, bit of your time to be on this. And, you know, I know for me as the mayor of the city, um, you know, there's no roadmap to navigate pandemic and uh, economic downturn and all of the other dynamics, but I'm grateful for the resources we have in Framingham. And we, uh, you know, as Caitlin alluded to, um, in the last two and a half years, I've learned about the richness of all that is offered in our uh, community, a plethora of services that uh, keep our people in our community healthy. You know, whether it's someone that can go for their therapy session and also get childcare at the same time, that makes a world of difference for someone to be able to go to their job and, and, uh, and perform adequately. Um, I also think about our older adults and, and, and during this pandemic, um, you know, Adam alluded to it is having our older adults be telephone because that's more for their mental health than anything else that to have a human connection whereas they may have had a regular routine to go to the Callahan Center, but not to have that a part of their uh, day is as, di as disruption. And so to reach out and figure out those ways in which we can do a better job. And I, you know, and I'm thinking, as we go forward, um, I'm with Adam. I think telehealth is wonderful, um, you know, and, and, and it's once again to keep folks safe in our community. Um, I, I just can't thank you all enough for sharing your expertise. And, and as Jay said, you're a human first, you're a person first, and you're your job afterwards. And, and those of you that know me well know that I lead with the heart and uh, you know probably one of the most challenging things for me during this pandemic is not to be able to give hugs anymore or be able to engage uh, with folks in a way that is most uh, comfortable for me um, but uh, I, I also know that we're in this together and, and as long as we're conscious and being a support to other people uh, that's going to be the most uh, wonderful thing that we can do to make sure that everyone moves through this pandemic, moves through this time, and, and, uh, and move through whatever trauma they're going through uh, in a healthy way. 
Um, I want to also thank uh, Senate President Spilka, who I was with a little bit earlier today, and uh, Representative Gentile and Lewis and Robinson, um, and in addition to all of you, because we all care about the same thing. And that's one of the reasons why this evening is so critically important. Um, I want to thank all of our agencies that uh, engage in mental uh, safety and health for our community, whether it's dealing with youth, older adults, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, it is imperative that uh, we continue to work collaboratively on these initiatives. Uh, the city council, um, and, you know, Adam being a forerunner, and um, you know, I don't want to embarrass Adam, but uh, you know, I just I'm I'm so proud of him because he's one of my former students. <laughs> so, but I also look at the leader and dad that he is, and and navigating a lot uh, as as a parent and uh, as an educator as well. Uh, our school department, um, you know, it, it, once again, they are an integral part of this process and work. So I just want to say thank you all for uh, spending this uh, hour. It, it's, it, you know, it goes so quickly, you know, but I do appreciate you spending this hour and, uh, and I hope it was insightful, um, uh, lots of great resources. So once again, thank you, Adam, Caitlin, uh, 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 Cheryl and Bonnie and Jay. I really appreciate all of you. So have a great night. Thank you, Mayor Spicer. Very well said. And uh, thank you to everybody. Um, stay safe and, um, and um, hopefully see each other in person soon. Have a great night, everyone. Be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>